Hey everyone, it's George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the compilation from the highlights from 2021 on the Innovators Mindset podcast. And as I've done the three weeks previously, I've talked about some lessons that I've taken uh, over this year from the podcast. In the first week, I talked about gratitude, why it's really important to appreciate the things that we have as opposed to that we don't. Uh, the second week, I talked about really take care of our own well-being. That yeah, of course, we need to continue to push, you know, to to actually have you know organizations really you know find ways that they're not creating problems in our lives, um, but that we always have that ownership over ourselves. That we can have that opportunity to take care of our own health through this process. Um, the third week, I talked about who do you surround yourself and why that's so important, and really kind of being that person for others, being the energy when you enter a space. Um, the fourth one, the last one I want to talk about is kind of connecting all of these things. And it's something I talk about all the time is relationships. And one of the things that you don't see when I do this podcast is that, um, typically they're about 35, 40 minutes long. I record about a 10, 15 minute episode of, um, the three question series. But what I try to do with all my guests time permitting is that sometimes I just actually all the time. I try to have conversations to get to know who they are as people before the podcast. And a lot of times people are like, hey, what question you ask me? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I want to talk to you before. Because even in such a short amount of time, building those relationships is so imperative. And I, I want people to be in the space. I want them to feel comfortable, supported, that I know enough about them. That sometimes I, the first time I meet them is, is on that Zoom call, is on that uh, recording. And I want to know them because I want to do my best to bring out the best in them. And so this is not just true in teaching, but it's true, hopefully on this podcast, that spending that time getting to know people. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes the, sometimes the things that we talk about um, before we record are actually really exciting, but I don't necessarily know if we record them. But I have like really long conversations and I made really incredible friends from this podcast having some um, you know, these conversations. So not only in education, but in life, those relationships matter. And uh, you'll see this as a theme throughout the Innovators Mindset podcast. And like a lot of people are like, well, you talk about relations all the time, but this is about innovation. If, if people know you support them, if they know you got your back, they're going to be way more innovative. And I think that's something that I always talk about. And I wanted to do my best to embody that. I don't meet that standard all the time. Sometimes I mess up more than I... Um, you know, I'm successful, but I, I do try to focus on it every time. So really kind of focus on those relationships is really at the heart of all the work that we do. So just wanted to share that lesson that I've had from this last year of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to connect. I'd love to hear from you. Connect with me on Twitter, on Instagram, G Crows. Love for you to um, like this video, sub. I don't ever say that. I don't know why I don't, but it'd be great. Super helpful to the podcast. But thank you so much for being here this year with me, uh, taking the time to listen to this podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. I love doing it. And um, it's one of my favorite things is sitting down and talking to people, especially if I don't know them. Uh, it's always w great to, to meet new people and learn from their experiences. And I, I feel I've become a better educator through this process, and I hope you have too. So um, thanks for taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoy this episode of the highlights from 2021 from the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Thanks. <laughs> I, like, I, I think that some people hearing this might think, okay, this is great for the students who want to maybe go into a career similar to yours. But I actually think it's beneficial to every student because like one of the things that I've talked about forever, if every kid is getting Googled and we're constantly telling them, hey, don't do this stuff because, um, because if anyone finds anything negative of you, you're going to lose opportunity where I'm saying, well, if everyone's Googling you and they find incredible stuff, then you're going to actually be in an advantage. So like how, so how does what you're talking about actually benefit a student who's not necessarily going on to become a journalist or maybe do this as their main, you know, wants to do a career that doesn't necessarily have. And I, I don't want to say this as a focal point, but the main focal point, because like businesses know that if you want to, um, I, I don't know if you remember, if you ever saw the, the dollar shave club, um, the dollar Ooh, shave, dollar shave club for man. For sure. Do you remember like the, there was like the first commercial that went viral and it was so ridiculous 
that it actually basically started this business, but it was the, the business was around a razor, but it was, it was the video that got people like all of a sudden signing up to it. So I think that when you're looking at that, there's different elements of this too, but it's, this is what you're talking about is not just for the students who want to solely go into video creation, correct? Like absolutely, it, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, it has nothing to do with a student wanting to be a journalist like I was mm -hmm. or be in the media profession. It has everything to do with transferable skills. We teach science. And to your point, I'm not mm -hmm. against science, but every child would not be a scientist, but it's about what they learn right. through going through the scientific process. We have sports. Certainly you and I would have would have liked to be a professional athlete and so many parents put their child in sports. Mm -hmm. A lot of them might feel like their child will be a professional athlete, but it's about the teamwork and it's about the work ethic. We have, you know, music and, and Spanish, but every child isn't going to be a pianist. It's about mm -hmm. the transferable skills that they learn through the video creation process. That's what I really hope that educators and specifically administrators take away from this. It's about the reading because you have to do research and read information and the research. It's about the writing, as you mentioned, whether it's just a skit or a video story, mm -hmm. before you do anything, you have to write it out. It's about the presenting. So many times when I work with young people, because I have a journalist background, I, I emphasize narration and voiceover. So, you know, what is your pacing like? What is your tone like? What is your projection? We need these communication mm. skills because there are still adults who have a fear of public speaking. Yes, there is technology in terms of editing and things of that nature, but it's not just about being a media professional or being a journalist. It's skills that they can use in anything. If you want to open up your own restaurant, mm -hmm. it will be good to know how to write videos to show case the food choices that you have if you want to open up a, a, a hair salon it will be good to show the different hairstyles that you can do through video and can write that and can film that and present that if you want to be a, a real estate agent and you want to showcase homes every single profession mm -hmm. a car dealership uh, uh, if you're in finance and business like every profession you're going to need to know how to create videos and need to know how to write and going back to the example of presenting again if you're uh, going to apply for a job and have an interview. You need to know how to present yourself and need to know how mm -hmm. to speak. So this really has nothing to do with being a journalist as I was of being a media professional is now taking technology, putting it in the classroom and, and changing the way that we teach students basic skills that is now more relevant and relatable to today's society, but it also has benefits that they can utilize in their mm -hmm. everyday life. I, I hope that comes across. I, I don't, I've been referred to as an expert, right? And people look at books that I've written and stuff like that. And I've never felt that way. And I, I would want to be an expert learner and Katie Novak will be, if she's listening, would be so excited about, you know, hearing that like really like try to understand learning, but that's a whole process. But when you're, and you, you mentioned earlier and we kind of lost it because we had a little uh, connection issue. Um, those spaces when, when I do those keynotes, when, you know, I, I love sharing ideas, but I'm like open to the pushback after. And it's, yeah. it's kind of like, it really sharpens, um, you know, kind of what I'm thinking. And I, I'll tell you, so, I've done a very similar keynote, you know, many, many times. And I know you've seen it more than once. And I always try to tweak and things like that. I could go through every element of my, of a keynote that I've done, you know, a hundred times over and say, Hey, I remember talking about this and this person challenged me in Wisconsin. And so I changed it because that, that made sense on how they rephrased it. And I remember here I was in, you know, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and somebody said this to me. And that made me think different about that. And so like, it's like everything that I share, I feel has like little remnants of conversations that I've had over time that have made me better. Right. And I think for me, it's not about me being better than someone. It's about me be becoming better at what I do. And that means kind of tapping into others. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you speak to that, you know, the keynotes have a great purpose of energizing and starting people thinking but you give that keynote and then, yeah, there's, mm -hmm. if there's no follow-up and I've been at conferences where you've given a keynote and then maybe that's it, but 
some of yep. the other ones, you have some follow-up sessions. And I, I love sitting in on those follow-up sessions because really that's where some great conversation and great growth happens. And you say it's um, not just you, and it's really not just you. You're growing, but also the participants are growing. And it mm -hmm. really, it's really powerful stuff. And really, I think, I think that speaks to something we want in our classrooms too. If you are just stopping with what you do in terms of lecture and there's no conversation, um, I think that's an issue. And now as me as a teacher, uh, I'm not someone who sits up and lectures a lot and I'm not someone who's gonna, who doesn't do a great job at facilitating large group discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think the great thing I love about technology is that the ability to have those conversations digitally with my students. Helping involve the student in the process of learning. So when I started to explain to the students what we had to do in fourth grade. I actually, one time I did a four or five combo. And when I did four or five combo, it forced me to be more allegiant to the kids than the content because I, it was two full grade levels of lots of standards and curriculum. And so I just put it out there to them and said, here's what fourth graders are mm -hmm. kind of supposed to be learning about. And here's what fifth graders are supposed to be learning about. Do you see any of these things that we can connect and learn together? Are there certain things that we need to do separate? And so basically, um, we kind of cleaned the garage together, if you will. Mm -hmm. What are we going to keep? What are we going to research more? And what are we going to let go of? Um, and that helped me as a teacher sort kind of prioritize the so much that I felt like I had to give to the kids and that was my responsibility, but I, I didn't do it alone. I activated the kids. And, and when you can form the question, you can get help from any kid, even if they're a five-year-old, even if they're a two-year-old, if you mm -hmm. can form the question um, as, a, as a teacher and say, here's what I'm trying to figure out, what can we do about that? Uh, it, and you, of course, you have your teaching partners mm -hmm. and things like that to help with that as well. And you try to get some of that organized, but I, I just guess, involve the learner in the lesson planning and you'd be surprised at how how wonderful that is the, the, so like when i hear the term backwards design right a lot of people use that terminology backwards design and they're really referring to uh designing from the curriculum and, and kind of like you know kind of what are your objectives things like that but i think when you're talking about backwards design you're like actually start with the student and move backwards from there, right? Like there's ways you can understand yeah. your student and then tie the curriculum, right? Exactly. So like you can't just say, like I would never say to Precisely. a school, ignore the curriculum because that's easy for me to say as an outsider while you all lose your job, right? Like I'm not, there's a reality of that. Yeah. Like there's expectations that you have, you know, that you sign up for and whether you like it or not, like I don't want to encourage people not to do their job. But it's really kind of understanding our students. That's why I talk about the notion of innovate inside the box and, and as something is really important. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to talk about this analogy I shared with you. Um, okay. And you, you know the one about the refing, right? Yes. So we talked about this. And so, you know, as a superintendent, like obviously st stuff is, it's not like everything's just smooth sailing lately, right? There's got to be some stuff that you deal with. And the analogy I shared with you is that I'm, I, I liken being a superintendent, actually, to be honest, you, a teacher, not yeah. just superintendents, uh, but basically anyone in education to when I used to ref basketball, especially at the high levels. And the thing that I always say is that when you ref basketball uh, or any sport, you are wrong 100% of the time to 50% of the people. It just depends on which 50%. Uh, whatever the day right and it, it feels like that all the time and you know people feel that so how how do you instead of like talking about like some of the things that you struggle with how do you how do you make tough decisions when you know that you're you're going to get pushback from s some group right away like how do you how do you actually come to the decisions that you make because i think that is actually much more important than necessarily the decisions you make or the the things that you have because like people you know sometimes if you're just making a decision because you're scared of this group mm -hmm. probably not going to be best for kids right so like yep. how do you how do you make decisions when you know you're going to get pushback on stuff that is that's a that's a great question George. i actually just uh, made that question up and yeah. i was like well, yeah, that, was a, that was a good question George. yeah i, I, feel I, I was i was pretty impressed I think you probably have a book somewhere. And I you're don't. Just reading off I was, I'm not going to lie. I'm like, that is a good question. <laughs> All right. Well, so I will say to you that um, as this has been my, this has kind of been my mantra ever since I was a building administrator. Mm -hmm. And, and this was shortly after I became a, a, a parent, I became a dad. 
Um, I would always say to everyone and anyone, whenever I had the opportunity to be in front of a group that I got to talk to, especially educators or those people working with me, um, I would say I would say to them that um, making decisions, um, especially tough decisions, has to be grounded in what it is that you would want to have for your own kids. Mm-hmm. You make decisions or you have to make decisions that are based on what you think is right, what you think is going to benefit kids, the majority of kids, right. hopefully all of kids right. in the most impactful way. And you have to see it through the eyes of not just a person who's doing a job, but as a person who is invested because you have your own kids that could benefit from that. Mm-hmm. So my, I, make, I, make, I make decisions based on what it is that I want for my own kids, my own biological kids. That actually when so for me, this is this is as as a parent, this is I'm taking off my educator hat. As a parent, this is my expectation. So Sean, if my kids are in your district, I would say to you, Sean, all I ask of you, never put my kid in a class that you wouldn't put your own kid. And that's that's what I want one hundred percent. That's what I want one hundred percent. Yeah. And I would say that to my staff too, all the time. Mm -hmm. If I walk into a classroom and I see something that I wouldn't want for my own kids. Mm I've got, I've got concerns and those concerns have to be addressed. Yeah. And I, I so appreciate that because I think sometimes, um, we can get caught up in how some of the adults are talking. Right. And it's, I, I, I always try to assume positive intent. I, I really do. Right. And even, even as a, as a principal, uh, you know, in my time, sometimes when I feel like a conversation was getting lost for me, right? Like was going in a, a negative direction. I would actually say like to uh, uh, the parent, the caregiver, hey, hey, we're here to do what's best for your child, correct? And I would actually, I wouldn't just make it as a statement. I'd make it, I'd ask it as a question mm-hmm. because I wanted them to, uh, to agree with that statement to center them and myself. Because I think sometimes... Um, it would be easy for my ego to get lost in that situation where it's now like, okay, now I just, I'm just going to like argue with this parent because like, I, I'm not liking the situation. And then you could easily lose yourself and not focus on the kid. Right? right. And so I think that was for me, like I always tell people when you're having some of those tough decisions, you have to have that kind of centering moment where people are reminded why they are there. Uh, I hear sometimes you hear this on social media, you hear this in conversations and in staff rooms, like, well, you know, like that person probably that admin's probably not a good teacher. And I'm like, I don't think every, I don't think every admin ha- had to be a good teacher. I think some administrators are actually better in that role than they were teachers. I don't think that everyone was this incredible, amazing teacher. Now, like, do you have to understand education? Yeah. Totally. But there it's, there's different skill sets there too. Right. And, and I know you're a big sports guy. Like I always, some of the, some of the best coaches were terrible players and some of the worst coaches were amazing players like Michael Jordan I, I mean, or like Magic Johnson, right? Terrible coach, favorite player of all time, terrible coach. Uh, Michael Jordan hasn't been the greatest GM, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Larry Bird is one of the exceptions for basketball, right? Like he was a very good coach. Uh, very good player. And so it's interesting to kind of like uh, see that uh, Doc Rivers was a very good player, very good coach. So you you kind of see um, that it's not like, I'm not saying if you're a great teacher, you can't be a great leader. Um, but being a great teacher doesn't mean you're a great leader. And like, I don't know what you think about that. Because I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Like, I think that people maybe in administrative roles see things maybe a different way can help people a different way, but not necessarily the best teachers. I don't know what you think about that. I, you know, I, I haven't really thought about that, but I, I would have to agree with a lot of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. What it reminds me of is this is when we interview all kinds of teacher, you know, all kinds of teachers, I'm not in those interviews anymore, but I used to be in a lot of those interviews. Sometimes your best teachers were the kids who were below average students, right? right? Or they got in trouble, right? Some kids who got in trouble in high school and they finally figured it out 
because they might they might have been really good leaders, but they weren't like I mentioned, you weren't doing the right things. Maybe you were involved in the wrong crowd, but you had these leadership abilities, right? Mm-hmm. So when we hired teachers, it wasn't like we were looking for the 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 4.0 high school students or the 4.0 college students. We we're looking for the, some of those kids who maybe struggled and then a light s- switch flipped right. on and suddenly because they understand what it's like not only to be, you know, work with the high level kids, but also to work with the kids who are struggling, who are right. disengaged, mm-hmm. who don't want to be at school. So I think there's a lot of parallels there with a teacher who struggled and understands the struggle of a, uh, of a struggling teacher. So they, so they know how to work with those teachers who are underperforming. Um, so I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. You are an amazing writer. You are a writer before you became a teacher. And I think to me, there's so many teachers that are really brilliant in their content area, love that stuff that they do, and they want to share and elevate people in that same area, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like they're yep. failed at that too, but there is like a, there's a different way of being. So like I've been thrown off, like I was like, really people say that? In your career path, you kind of totally debunk that notion, right? Like am I off well, there or what? No, no, I was gonna say, I think that quote should really be teachers who love, like people who love teach. Mm -hmm. Um, I like, you can love your content. And people say this of high school teachers all the time and college professors, like, they don't love kids, they love their content. And elementary teachers traditionally love kids, but maybe don't have the same depth of knowledge around the particular subjects that they're teaching all of them. Um, And I, I believe that to really inspire kids, like part of what gave me so much credibility right. in my classroom was the fact that I was doing what I was asking them to do. Yeah. And I was really comfortable sharing my crappy first drafts with them and showing them the comments my editors put on things and, and even being really transparent about my reaction to those comments the first time I read them or going back through some of my old papers even Mm -hmm. and saying to them, you know, when you're a writer, you're on this journey and it's always evolving and you could be super proud and it could be the best you are right now when you look at it. But in five years from now, you're going to look at it again and you're going to have evolved from that place. And when you have that writing is not going to feel so great anymore because it's just the best of where you were at that time. And Writing is one of those skills that is ever evolving. Your vocabulary is growing, your style can shift and change. And especially as young writers, as you're developing your voice, like having those opportunities to try on different voices until you Mm -hmm. find the one that fits that's your own and being able to share that journey with them and have them be a part of my writing journey. Because many of my students have been part of my books, whether they've written things specifically for the books or I've used their work as evidence of the things that I was talking about. And now I've been blessed. I have like a handful of kids who are teachers Mm -hmm. because I taught the 12th grade. They come back to me as a, you know, looking for me to be a mentor to them as a new teacher. And Mm -hmm. it's like the greatest gift to see these kids evolve from teenagers into young professionals after they finish school and the fact that they still want me to be a part of their journey it's like Mm -hmm. you know how could you say there that people who can't teach if you have this ongoing opportunity to build these beautiful relationships with young people who could change the world even now when i talk when i go back to schools or or just pop in and say hey what Right now it's summer school, but I plan on coming back and showing my face a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, even now, the first thing I tell them is honesty. You have to be honest with yourself. And no one one knows who you are completely besides you. Mm -hmm. You can fake it. You can try to BS it. You can you can do all those things, and a lot. I know a lot of people who got through high school BSing it but it doesn't do you any good. You have to be honest with yourself and, and really sit down and ask yourself, okay, am I passing this class because I'm learning the curriculum or am I just, have, have I figured out a way to beat the system? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's always nice to get a win, but 
it's, it's better to win the war, mm -hmm. I always say. So winning the war is being honest with yourself and, and really using those resources. Use your resources. Go to your teachers and be honest and upfront. This is who I am. This is how I learn. And this is how I want to learn. Can we work on something? Can we, can we implement a certain type of like lesson plan for just me and, and others that learn just like me? Be honest and, and mm -hmm. try to take those steps in the right direction towards actually learning instead of BSing and just getting through or getting by. As well as do any and everything you can in high school, like the extra curricular activities, whether it's field trips or for me, like I always had crazy opportunities, like going to speak to other children, whether they're in high school or whether they're in middle school or elementary school, like just taking those, taking advantage of those experiences because it makes, it gives you a, a new perspective on high school. So try to change the perspective you currently have if it's not a positive one, you know? And just be, just be yourself, just be yourself, but don't do it, don't be yourself in, in hopes of getting back at the system because it, it hasn't done you right. Mm -hmm. Be yourself in hopes of beating the system because you know you can do it and you have the ability to do it. School isn't for everyone. The system isn't for everyone, but you have to do your part in order to change that. And you get you, you create the change by being honest and taking those opportunities to be a better student. It starts with us, honestly. When you saw that, um, that connection between like literacy, um, did you find like the students were actually quite literate, but just, it was like not a context they were using in school. Like how, what did that look like? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, going back to your, your question that, that you'd posed about mm -hmm. blog posts versus essay. I mean, I think it's all functional, right? That's what's mm -hmm. important to me as a teacher. I would say like, you know, what context are you going to need to write in? Mm -hmm. and what are, what context are you interested in learning to write in? Uh, most of the most of the like what I would characterize as literacy events or literacy skills that I have, I picked up through engagement mm -hmm. and I picked them up kind of because they were ambient. Right. They're in the spaces in which I engage. Right. I don't think most of them were taught to me in any rote or direct way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's what the kids were really doing. They're picking up on how to respond to the audiences in the spaces where they were interacting what the formats and forms of the different mm -hmm. types of communication were. And it's really learned through that social engagement with their peers. And I was thinking, you know, this could translate. You don't want to take and kind of colonize kids out of school literacy practices. There's right. nothing more off-putting than that, like <laughs> for a right. high school student. Right. Right. Um, but, you know, looking at, okay, if social engagement works to teach literacy skills, how can we foster that in the classroom. Yeah, that, 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 I think that's such a, like the, um, the thing that I say to people is that I don't really think you have to teach keyboarding classes anymore. And those all oh, my kids don't type blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, have you ever taught like a keyboarding class on a, a phone? And they're like, no. I said, but do you see how fast kids are? Because they actually care, right? Yes. And it's part of the context, it's part of the connection. So a lot of a lot of the, the the reason behind that. Now I don't have like you know research on this or anything like that, but like other than what I see with my eyes, kids can just fly through this stuff because they care what they're doing. But then uh, you know like the fox jump over the brown hat or whatever. That's not you know that's not going to get kids excited about writing. And then they start like doing this on a computer or whatever. But when they text their friends, you know like being fast is a way to stay in the conversation. So it, it, I, I appreciate that you say that because it is different context, right? Like how I write to a friend, write to my brother versus how I write a blog post versus write an email to someone I don't know. Those are all different things. I, I know how to kind of switch in and out, but it's like a lot of the things that we teach in, you know, a traditional, not a bad, but a traditional English class are really important in that facet. But there's also these other spaces too, where kids connect. 